Hi, everyone. Um, I'm like very sorry to keep you for lunch, and I know that we just did all that raffle, so this talk won't be that long, so uh, don't worry, lunch will be there when this is done, so cool. Um, so hi, my name's Chris. You can find me online at Twitter. Um, you can get me on speaker deck, and I'll be putting up all my slides on there after this. Uh, and then I occasionally post some code things to GitHub as well, so you can look for that on there. Um, just before we start, I wanted to plug another conference, which is a bit unusual at a conference, but this is uh, also the, the, the other best premier regional conference there is in Elixir. So if you, if you didn't come last year, basically MPEX is a one-day single-track conference in New York City, which is where I live. Um, I'm one of the organizers. We're looking for people to come and speak. Uh, the CFP is open until March the 12th. Basically, it's just a really, really fun day. We host it in this really awesome jazz club in Soho, and we do a lot of really fun activities, and there's always a lot of uh, good people and good vibes. So this will be our second year, and I'd love to see some of you down there. So tickets are on sale now. You can get everything at mpex.co. Um, now that the plugs are over, and that's not a plug joke, honestly, um, I'm going to be talking about today uh, umbrella apps in Elixir. So I actually gave this talk a few weeks ago at a meetup, and someone came up to me after, and they were like, you know you really need to rename that talk because it's not really about using your umbrella. So I've kind of put a subtitle in here, which is the what, why, and how to use umbrella apps. So um, I'm going to give you, uh, to start with, just a really, really brief introduction to applications and umbrella applications in Elixir. Um, and then we're going to move on to talking about some designy kind of things. And hopefully that will pique your interest a bit more than talking about applications. So in Elixir, some of you may know this, but an application is a component that, it, that implements some specific functionality which can be started and stopped as a unit and which can be reused in other systems. So basically applications in Elixir are pretty much like libraries in most other languages. But one of the other key parts here is that they can be started and stopped as a unit. So any of you who have done some Elixir programming, you're probably very familiar with your mix file and your dependency declarations like this, uh, where we have, uh, where we can specify some dependencies like Ecto or Phoenix or even this other library, which is called Spotify EX. And some of these libraries might, uh, uh, sorry, all of these things here are actually applications. And some of them may start up process trees and some of them may just include some library code as well. So we have this kind of difference where we can start these applications as units like we might do with Ecto, or we can just include some code like we might do with Spotify EX. So the long and the short of it is that applications give us a defined way to configure and run our Elixir code. So if you've worked with one application, you can move on to another application, and it's very easy to kind of know where you are and know like actually how to, how to write these things and actually uh, how to configure and run them as well. And that's great for our systems because it gives us a defined way for our system to kind of bring these things up into life. And we've talked a lot over the last couple of days about OTP and all the wonderful concepts there. And applications out of actually come out of OTP as well. Um, so again, just a very simple example. If you do any kind of uh, mix new with a, the dash dash sup flag to start up a supervisor, you get something that looks like this which is just showing that we have this defined way to say that um, the module my app is actually the entry point into our application and can start up all these process trees. So that's kind of what applications are. Um, so an umbrella application, and many of you may have heard of them or possibly started to use them in your applications. So an umbrella application is a single repository that inside of it is made up of one or more local applications. So this is really, really handy when we want to actually start composing our applications of, uh, of sub-applications and libraries that we don't want to host in a remote source. So we can always put our code on hex. That's always a possibility. Or we could always use Git modules to do dependencies. But a, a really nice way to keep everything local, and especially when you don't need to publish it externally, is to use umbrella applications to do that. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through what that looks like now. So we can run our mix new command, and we can give it a dash dash umbrella flag. 
And what that will do is create a, di a directory structure that looks like this. We have a single configuration point here. Um, we have a, a mix file at the top level where we can specify um, application-wide dependencies. And then we have our apps folder, which is where, you guessed it, all of our apps live. So when we want to create a sub-application here, we CD into the apps folder. We can do mix new inside of there. And mix is smart enough to know the context that it's inside of an umbrella application. And it's going to create you um, an application with everything that references up to the, to the top level umbrella as well. Um, and you can even do that for Phoenix as well. So as of like yesterday, that command should be replaced by uh, PHX. Um, if you're using the 1.3 release, but anyway, I'll get onto that in a bit. Um, so when we create those apps, we get a directory structure that looks like this. We have our apps inside of that, inside of that directory. We have our web app and our sub app, sub app here. And what we can do is actually, um, if we have tests across all of those applications, we can run this mix test command from the top level, and that's going to traverse into all of the, into the child apps and run tests inside of there, and then we get an aggregated view of all of the test results. So it's really handy uh, to develop these umbrella applications. So you don't have to sacrifice many of the tools that you're used to in order to start writing umbrella apps today. Um, and similarly, if we want to start up the entirety of the umbrella application, we can do that from the top level as well. And that's going to start up uh, the applications inside of it. So um, often I'll build Phoenix apps inside and possibly have a single entry point, uh, like a proxy or something like that. And we can start that service, so then we'll be able to access that on a port like we would a normal Phoenix application. Um, and when we, want to, when we want to rely on these applications, when we want to say that one of our apps depends on another app in the umbrella, we can just use this, this really simple piece of terminology here. We just give it the name of the application. So um, in this case, we're inside of our web app, and we're going to say that the web app depends on the sub app. And all we have to say is give it that in umbrella true. And it will know how to wire those things up and run it as a unit. So you, um, you may all be thinking, like, yeah, I know all of this. And like, yeah, I get it. I've, I've used umbrella apps. Um, but really, the big idea coming out of umbrella apps here is that we can make these more complex applications that are composed of small, isolated applications. And uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So now that we've got past the introduction to umbrella apps, we can start talking about designing them. Um, so before we start, I'm just going to give you uh, a bit of a warning that this is all my opinion, and this is something that I've done on a project. So um, there, there are a million ways to do this. Uh, I hope this approach is useful for you, and we can definitely discuss trade-offs at the end as well. So let's steal some ideas from domain-driven design. There's, there's a ton of really, really great ideas out there in the community, uh, especially coming around from the .NET community. There's a lot of similarities between some of the concepts that we have in Elixir and some of the other concepts that we're using in, uh, in the .NET world. So, Especially um, if you look at F Sharp, we have similar operators in Elixir. I would even go so far as to say that Link, if any of you have used C Sharp, is fairly similar to Ecto in a lot of ways. Um, and, and the idea of domain-driven design is very big in that community. And some people here might be thinking like, ooh, I don't want to do any of that, like bring in all of that OO baggage and that kind of thing into my applications. But um, hopefully I can show you today about how that, that can work for you in a smaller kind of way. So what we're going to be talking about today is really separa uh, separating your applications into these specific bounded contexts. So some of you may be familiar with this term. Some of you may not be. I'm going to literally rip a quote out of the Eric Evans domain-driven design book, which is the Bible for domain-driven design. Um, so there are conceptual boundary where a domain model is applicable. It provides ubiquitous language that is spoken by the team and express in a carefully designed software model. Um, so a lot of you may be thinking, huh, ha what, what does that mean? How do I apply that? And honestly, a lot of uh, Eric's book is quite dense and reads a lot like this. So um, if, you're, if you're really fond of reading something like that, go ahead. Uh, but 
hopefully I can explain this in a simpler way and give it a, a bit of my take here. So the, the way I think about um, bounded context is just br think about breaking your app into smaller pieces that have clear responsibilities and boundaries around them. So I'm going to hopefully show you some examples and that will become a bit clearer, but keep thinking about these boundaries around our, around our applications. So applying this to umbrella applications, um, we want each application in our umbrella to focus on a single context. So that means that, again, it has those boundaries around it and it, it, it focuses on one part of our bigger problem space that we're, we're tackling with our applications. So let's see an example. So the canonical example in domain-driven design is often an e-commerce app. Um, because I'm not that inventive, I'm also going to use that model. Um, so let's say that we have an e-commerce application that processes sales, ships orders, manages customer support requests, and manages a product catalog. So lots of very common kind of functionality for an e-commerce app. So if we were going to approach this into... Um, into a design where we put everything into bounded context and into more of an umbrella application uh, approach where we split everything out, we could start to think of it looking a bit like this. So we might have uh, two applications at the, at the front here, which could be our API, and one could be our, our back office or our admin application, and they might be Phoenix applications here. Uh, and th the boundary around the edge here this represents our, our repository for our projects. So that this, in, in essence, is the umbrella app. And inside of here are the individual applications that are the individual contexts that we're going to be talking about. So we might have one for sales, for shipping, for customer support, and for that product catalog as well. So the really nice thing here is that every application inside of that, inside of our larger context that we're dealing with, can be tested in isolation. We can develop these applications in isolation. We can deploy them independently, and we can actually hide the complexity from those other applications through these defined public interfaces. So the idea of modularity in software is often to hide, to hide those complex decisions from anything else, from the outside world. And that encourages an, an easier way to change and develop your software. Um, so the, the deployment in, um, independently and, and composing these umbrella applications and deploying them separately, I'll, I'll touch on at the end. Um, also, Paul did a great job of talking about distillery, and hopefully I can elaborate on that a bit more as well. So, yeah, you can kind of think of these applications as microservices. Um, microservices is obviously the buzzword, and uh, Paul's diagram of, of the emojis perfectly summed it up in my mind. And there's a fantastic blog post from Jose about this, uh, where he talks about using Erlang and Elixir to kind of build up these applications and thinking of them as microservices without much of the trade-offs that we have if we're going to be deploying smaller services as well. So what about integrating with Ecto in these applications? So um, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Ecto. Uh, our persistence library. So our applications aren't, aren't that great unless we're actually storing some state to a, somewhere and actually doing something with it. So just a refresher. Again, our application design looks a bit like this. So remembering that everything in here is, a, is a, an application inside of our umbrella. So one way that we've approached this before is that we've actually introduced a single, uh, what we call a DB app, that is our entry point into our database and is the point in which we keep all of our migrations as well. So this gives us a really nice place to kind of put the stuff that we didn't want to scatter around all of those other apps, and it gives us a single point in which we can start up our Ecto repo and all of the pools of workers um, that that has as well, and also do our configuration of that Ecto repo in one place as well, instead of scattering that around the apps. So, that might look like this in our diagram, where DB, again, is another app inside of our umbrella. And we pretty much, um, we, we treat that like a regular Ecto repo. So uh, we have an entry point into our repository, into our database, uh, through using the Ecto repo here. And then inside of our DB app, 
we just depend on Ecto and we depend on Postgrex in this example. So what that might look like in terms of your application design is that I'm um, just focusing on the sales and the shipping app here. But we have, these, we have these applications inside of our umbrella that communicate with our database through this DB app. So every time that we want to make an update to the database, we'll, we're going to be referencing the repo through that DB application. And in this example, what we've done is we have um, customer order and line items in both of these apps. And they're actually Ecto schemas in both places. And you might be thinking, oh, that's a bit weird, but I'll, I'll hopefully touch on that in a sec. But so the idea here is that we basically have each application defining its own schemas, which are essentially these like value objects in DDD terms that we can then pass around. But the idea is that we're focusing on the specific functionality for each one of the apps. Right? So in this example, again, we've pulled out the sales and the shipping app. And we're looking at a customer schema in both of those applications now. But um, we, we might have a completely different set of fields that the, the sales schema maps to in the database than we have with the shipping customer. So an example might be that our shipping customer uh, might not need an email address, whereas our sales customer might actually need an email address. So because we have this separation between these schemas and our actual database in Ecto, we can, we can define these in two places, but they're still using the same source under the hood. And you might be thinking, but we're duplicating our schemas. Um, and yeah, you're, you're going to be right in that sense. But remember that Dry isn't, isn't necessarily about duplicate, duplication of logic. Um, sorry, Dry is about <coughs> avoiding duplication of logic and not duplication of code. So in our example before, if you might see some, some duplicate code, but the logic is very likely different between those two places. And if it's not, what we can do is move that into a somewhere shared and kind of share it between those two places instead. So when we want to call out to this database, um, we can do so through entities or aggregates or services. Personally, um, I, I pretty much call everything a service in this sense. Uh, remember, that could, be, that could be a set of processes or whatever you want to do in this case. We're just encapsulating that inside of these umbrella applications. And then we're providing that as a public interface for all our other applications that are relying on this behavior. Um, so an example of that might be in our sales app. We have this order manager that can complete an order Again, it's going to build up this change set, and it's going to call out to the DB repo here. And remember that this is in our sales app. So then, um, basically, when we want to depend on that database app, we can do that in, that, in our domain context as well. So uh, in this example, again, we're looking at our sales application. And we just have to say that the sales app depends on the database app. And we always have to remember to start that application as well, because or unless we're using Elixir 1.4, in which case we don't have to do that. Um, but if we're using an older version, we do. Um, so this isn't the only option available. Uh, th there's a, actually some really interesting discussions in the, um, in the C-sharp community about doing this domain-driven design approach and actually having an entry point into your database in each, like they call them uh, solutions, we might call in our in our sensor, in our applications. So one other way that we could approach this is putting a repo in each one of those apps and then um, having the configuration in each. Or we might use a system like CQRS. Or th there's, there's many different ways to do this. But we've had great success with just splitting it out and having a single database app as an entry point here. So what about Phoenix in this context? I kind of showed you at the beginning how we might have that API and that back office app. And those can be uh, kind of our Phoenix applications into this wider amount of business context. So remember that, and you've probably heard this, and everyone I feel like is beating this point like a drum right now, but Phoenix is not your application. Phoenix is this web layer into this bigger world of your business logic and your domain logic. And because we have this powerful umbrella app idea, we can kind of do this very, very elegantly and very easily. Um, 
So let's see an example of that. So let's say we're dealing with our API and we're dealing with our checkout controller in, the, in our API. We might be calling out to our sales manager, sorry, our sales order manager here, which is actually in that sales context that we were looking at earlier. Um, and that will handle all of our business logic for us and everything to do with processing sales. And our Phoenix app really concerns itself with all of the things web, like processing parameters and dealing with sessions and reading headers and all of that kind of, all of the stuff that, you know, Phoenix is good at. And, it's, and all of those things fit inside of that web concern uh, world. So one really cool thing is that Phoenix 1.3 has introduced uh, generators to do this inside of your app. Hopefully everyone saw the announcement yesterday and Chris McCord's talk at Lone Star Elixir. So Phoenix 1.3 takes a slightly different approach in that they are using the idea of context, but they're placing them, inside, uh, it's placing them inside of the lib folder instead of inside of separate applications. Um, personally, I prefer moving these things out into their own applications just because we might have a bunch of different processes started there. And I also really like this boundary that moving them into their own applications creates in that you actually have this physical kind of separation with your team that they might be working on one app and someone else might be working on another app as well. So if we do all of this, like what does it give us? What's, what's the point of doing this? So we end up with this um, dependency flow where everything kind of points in one direction, which is really nice. So what we're really talking about here is, is a sense of looser coupling between our code. So we end up with a flow that might look like this, where everything only points and knows about something on the inside of it. The sales app doesn't have to know anything about the web or anything about the world outside of it. Um, and again, the API doesn't really have to know that much except for calling into those, those applications as well. So there's, there's a fantastic article by uh, Tef, which is called Write Code That Is Easy to, to Delete, Not Easy to Extend. And really, like, loosely coupled code isn't going to just give you like, everything from day one, but it really, really helps in a sense that it, it gives your team and you the ability to write more maintainable code that hopefully is easier to change over the long term. So we're, we're kind of taking that big ball of mud idea, splitting it out, and using the power of Elixir to do that. And for those who've come from the Rails world, we used to, like, we used to dabble with these ideas with like cells, and there was hexagonal Rails architecture. But all of those concepts were kind of bolt-ons into Rails, whereas uh, with Elixir, at least we get this concept of applications where we can do this at, at a lower level as well. So what you end up with if you follow this kind of approach is, again, this clear separation of, con of concerns. Your Phoenix app becomes just this really, really thin layer uh, into all of your business context. And one really nice thing, and um, Uncle Bob has this article about the screaming architecture where um, your application screams its intent for those who look at it. And actually, this is a really nice win in the sense that someone new coming on your team can look at the code and immediately know the different contexts in which you deal with, all in this single monolithic repository. And then, again, you get this really nice, simple, unit-testable business logic that's totally separate from your UI. And if you wanted to, you could make that separate from your database as well. Um, personally, I'm not a huge fan of that approach, but uh, you know, your mileage may vary in that sense. Um, and of course, this is just one way of doing things, not necessarily the right way. Elixir is an amazing tool for being able to easily refactor code as well. Um, it, it feels very, very easy to pull out applications and move them around. And to be honest, most of the apps I've started with recently have been single monolithic Phoenix apps where there's a lot inside of the lib folder. And then we'd basically like pull things out into applications when we needed to as well. And honestly, that's, that's very trivial like, to do in, in Elixir as well. So don't feel like you have to start with this from day one. Um, I just wanted to touch on a few kind of gotchas that I've experienced and tips uh, for working with umbrella applications as well. Um, the first one is definitely if you're looking at deploying uh, 
umbrella applications. Definitely have a look at distillery. It is an incredible tool for being able to do the composition of those umbrella applications into whatever kind of means that you want. So uh, we can define basically separate releases where we can say that we have a release for our API, and we might have a release for our back office, and we can deploy those to totally separate boxes, and it will wire up all the dependencies as well for us. So if our API depends on only a few bits of our business logic or our other applications that we have, um, Distillery is smart enough that it's going to build that release with only those things inside of it, and then we can deploy that to a separate node or deploy it somewhere else. Of course, taking into account Paul's great talk earlier about trade-offs of doing this in a, a distributed manner as well. Um, there's a ton more on the uh, distillery page here for umbrella projects as well. Another tip um, that I found really useful is using xdoc for all of these bounded contexts as well. So just actually writing documentation and then generating that documentation for all of these for all of these applications and then having that as something that you can share with your team as well. Uh, that's been hugely useful for us. And again, like writing specs as well. Just like even if you don't use Dialyzer, um, just writing specs so you can show what return values are there. I, I just find that hugely useful as well. Um, again, don't, you don't have to do this on day one. Refactoring is so simple. Um, and honestly, I, I've done this like I think about three times now. I should probably just start with an umbrella app. Um, or you, could, you can also like, you can cut this a lot of different ways. You might think, okay, I'll just have my web app and then I can have uh, a single bounded context with everything in it. If, you're, if your business logic isn't that great that you need all of these separate contexts as well. So it's another way to do things. Um, one big gotcha is that circular app dependencies are not allowed inside of your umbrella applications. This kind of bit me at first when I got really, really excited about doing umbrella apps and started splitting everything out into a separate, app, separate application. It got way too granular and then basically I, I think that's a definite smell and that you have all of these things depending on each other and it's far, far better to think about a context in a bigger sense. Um, another gotcha is that you can't run um, gen migration from the top level. Honestly, like, you just have to CD into your apps and then into, if you have a single app for your database, you just CD into that app and you generate all your migrations from there. It's not too much of a big deal. Uh, and this one, this one has bitten me a couple of times where you might have lots of dependencies inside of your individual umbrella applications that all have the same kind of transient dependencies or different transient dependencies. And it, it gets quite difficult to work with at times. And often you, you have to use uh, override flags as well to, to kind of get around the situation. It's, again, it's one of those uh, interesting points that because it, it bundles up all of the dependencies into the top level, basically everything has to match inside of your umbrella apps. Uh, so we can talk about that more at, after if you, if you have any questions there. Um, so, thanks, and we'll be going to lunch now, but I'm really, really happy to take some questions before we do, or uh, if everyone just wants to run out, feel free to do that as well, so thank you. <laughs>